welcome guys welcome in another video lecture from microbiology with Shandi so we have been talked about various kind of microscopy techniques right so before this lecture we are generally solving the various kind of problems that we have faced in the previous lecture right so it this phenomenon is all started from the second lecture where we have seen about the bright field microscopy where we have faced a problem that we have to stain the biological specimen otherwise we cannot visualize them because of their semi transparent nature right and but staining causes the death of the microorganism okay so it is a very dangerous problem because as a result it signifies that we cannot visualize live sample right with the help of microscope so under such circumstances we have uploaded the lecture number three where we have seen about the dark field microscopy where we are using a annular stop which is under the condenser which help us or which allow only a hollow cone of light to pass through the sample and the rest of the light is blocked by its slit okay so that means here we are simply reducing the amount of the light okay and that allow us to visualize live sample under low illumination okay but here we have faced a new problem that due to such kind of low illumination we cannot distinguish between the cells and the artifact that is our impurities so under such circumstances we have uploaded our lecture number four that is phase contrast microscope so phase contrast microscope developed by fritz jernick literally solve the every kind of problem that a dark field microscopy faces okay so here we are using simply differences in phases created by due to the migration or due to the journey of electromagnetic radiation or our light through different different refractive index containing medium okay which either causes retardation of their wavelength or facilitates or advanced their wavelength right and then we have converted those kind of changes in wavelength into a detectable intensity with the help of what face plate right so that ultimately gives us a bright background and dark object right and in the dark object we can clearly visualize each and everything that is inside right so and face contrast microscopy literally solves every kind of problem because here now all the artifacts will present but you can clearly distinguish between that yes it is my artifacts and it is my cells okay so there is no problem now after the discovery of face contrast microscopy scientists starts to think about this that we have watching with the help of the first three microscopy in only cellular level right that means here we are just visualizing nucleus cytoplasm stuff so now scientists decided to develop something new that will help them to distinguish not only the cell also the various kind of proteins or various kind of let's say surface receptors molecules present in the cell that means from the cellular level scientists decided to visualize with the help of microscopy the protein level of a biological specimen okay so today we will going to visualize a biological samples in the protein level with the help of fluorescence microscopy okay before that lecture we have created all the image with the help of light that passes through the specimen right now let me introduce today we will going to use a such kind of object that will emit light after 
absorbing a particular wavelength light okay and this emitted light will help us to visualize object okay so this kind of objects is known as or this kind of i said i should say dyes are known as fluorophore or fluorochrome okay or more easily saying fluorescent dye okay so now there are various kind of naturally occurring dye presence for example if you are visualizing some plant cell so there is a component in plant we all know chlorophyll so chlorophyll can be easily visualized with the help of the principle of the fluorescence microscopy because it is a naturally illuminating or that chlorophyll can be naturally excited and we can emit light from that chlorophyll okay so and in some cases we have to use some kind of stains okay that will give our biological specimen the property of to be excited and then to release emission light okay so this kind of staining is quite different from what we have discussed in our lecture number 2 that is the normal staining so here we are using fluorescent staining or fluorochrome staining okay so we will also going to discuss about various kind of stain that we will use especially for fluorescence microscope okay so let's discuss about what is the normal principle of the fluorochrome or what is the principle on which a normal fluorescent dye works okay so let's see this circle that i have drawn here is a fluorescent molecule okay so now if you use a light of a particular wavelength okay that can be absorbed by that particular fluorescent dye or molecule what will happen this fluorescent molecule will be excited okay so now the question is what is the meaning of excitement or excited state so try to relate this with a simple example suppose there is a there is a movie of your favorite hero in the theater okay and you were in the day before the release date okay so naturally you will be too much excited for the movie okay and as a result in that particular time there will be too much energy in you for the excitement to see the movie okay and then the day before, day after when you will watch the movie after that the entire energy that is for the excitement of that movie will be totally released and you will be again in your ground state or i should say relaxed state okay so similar thing can be applicable for those kind of fluorescent dye or fluorophore so what is going on let us discuss again one more time so this is a fluorochrome or fluorophore so whenever a particular wavelength light is applied to them they will absorb that particular wavelength of light and become excited okay so this excited state remember it very carefully is the unstable state of that particular fluorochrome or fluorophore okay and it is also applicable to you because when you are too excited you are in a unstable state right you feel better when you are in relaxed state right so similar can be applicable for that fluorophore or fluorescent dye when it absorb that particular wavelength of the light it become excited and as a result it is transferred to the excited state so now let's look that diagram this diagram is known as jablonovsky diagram so here this s0 is the ground state okay or the relaxed state of the molecule so when 
this molecule will absorb a light of a particular wavelength it become excited and goes to this s2 phase some will also go to s1 phase depending on the type of the energy it absorb okay let's say you are a marvel fan okay you are a fan of okay so as iron man is no longer participating in my uh, in marvel so let's say you are a doctor strange fan okay so now you are too much excited uh, there are uh, doctor strange in the multiverse of madness in the theater and you want to watch the movie or experience the movie in the first day first show and there is an another friend of you who is hardcore bollywood fan okay but for you he or she also have to watch the movie okay and as a result the energy will be for him or her will be lower than as compared to you okay so the wavelength of dr strange multiverse of madness will work on you at a higher amount as compared to your friend and as a result you will be excited towards the s2 state and your friend will be excited towards the s1 state okay so similar can be applicable for the fluoro chrome or fluoropod some of the dye will be excited to the s2 state and some of them will be in s1 state okay now let's try to understand so as i have told you that this s1 or s2 state is the unstable state for those kind of fluoropod or fluorochrome okay so now what they will do they will start immediately releasing all the trapped energy in them in the form of light okay that means that means what that means after completion of the movie you will be relaxed by releasing all of the energy all of the excitement outside okay similar thing can be applicable for the fluorophore so they will release all of the energy and they will go back to their ground state okay so during this travel from the excited state to the ground state the fluorophore will release light or those trapped energy inside the fluorophore during its excited state will be released in the form of light okay and this light is known as emitted light clear so this emitted light will help us to create a image of the specimen with the help of fluorescence microscopy okay now there can be two situation that can happen so let's come back to the example that we have created imaginarily so the fluorescence light will be or the fluorescence will occur in case of your friend let me explain as i have told you that your friend let's suppose not too much excited about the movie so the excitement that is created because of you or because of the movie when he or she watch enjoying the movie will be down immediately just after ending the movie right so there can be two situation in fluorophore or fluorochrome when they go back to their down, uh, ground state so one situation is they will immediately come back to the ground state okay if it occurs then it results in the fluorescence okay and this kind of fluorescence will be used in fluorescence microscopy and if and the phosphorescence will occur in case of you because you are a hardcore marvel fan and it will take a larger time for you to come back into your relaxed state because you will be still excited you will kept on talking about the movie for about a week right then you will be in your ground state right so similar things can happen for fluorochrome or the fluorophore or the fluorescent dye because after during their
travel from the unexci uh, from the unstable or excited state to the stable state can be occur through various path the path can be too easy as in case of your friend or some cases the path can be time consuming okay so if the molecule come back to its exci uh, to its ground state very fast then it will result in fluorescence but if the molecule takes too much time to come back then it will facilitates phosphorescence okay so the various kind of paths the for come back or to the ground state is shown by this diagram and this diagram is known as jabnowski diagram okay so again try to understand this very carefully in a simpler way so this is the fluorochrome so suppose this is a particular wavelength of light on which it can be excited so if the fluorochrome will absorb the light and become excited as a result they will transfer to its excitation state okay now after this excitation state is unstable state i have told you okay so they will immediately removing all the trapped energy that it contains inside it in the form of light and this light is known as emitted light okay so this emitted light we will use to create a image of the specimen okay with the help of fluorescence microscopy that is the idea okay so now let me told you that there are two kind of fluorescence microscopy available one is ap fluorescence microscopy another one is our transmitted fluorescence microscopy okay so this is a diagram for ap fluorescence microscopy so i have taken this diagram from the prescott book so why the name ap fluorescence microscopy let me told you so it is because here the light source is above the sample okay and it is coming from a totally from a different angle right because it is let's say in parallel with the specimen but usually what we are familiar with we are familiar with that our light source will be below the specimen right but in that case the light source is above the specimen that is why the term ap fluorescence microscopy okay so this is the most common type of fluorescence microscopy we are using it is also known as incident or reflected light fluorescence microscopy okay so let me discuss so here there will be a condenser as well as objective lens okay try to remember this very carefully that the objective lens here we are using have two property one is condensing property that is usually conducted by condenser lens in normal microscopy but here objective lens have to play double role okay for such web some wavelength of light it will act as a condenser and for some wavelength of light it will act as a objective lens okay now so here the light source is a mercury vapor arc lamp or any kind of large light source we can use that can generate a intense beam of light for us okay now this intense beam of light will first face the excitation filter filter okay this excitation filter will only allow a particular wavelength of light okay and all the other wavelength of the light will be removed usually remember that excitation filter will remove all the longer wavelengths it will only allow wavelength which are shorter okay so now this short wavelength will face wavelength light will face a dichromatic mirror now let me explain what is the function of dichromatic mirror here so dichromatic mirror is a mirror which allow shorter wavelength of the light to be reflected or 
more specifically saying dichromatic mirror will reflect the shorter wavelength of the light downward and it allows larger wavelength of the light to pass through okay so remember that it will only reflect the shorter wavelength light okay and allow the longer wavelength of the light to be transmitted okay now after reflected by the dichromatic mirror the longer wavelength light will go through downward go towards towards the downward of the microscopy and during this time it will face the objective lens so here the objective lens will play the role of a condenser lens okay so objective lens will work as a condenser for only shorter wavelength of light okay and it will condense the light towards the specimen okay and let me tell you this specimen is already stained with the fluorochrome okay so as a result what will happen this shorter wavelength light will be absorbed by the specimen and they will emit a light of a larger wavelength okay so this is a another important property of the fluorochrome because remember the fluorochrome will absorb a light of a particular wavelength and emit a light of a another wave another particular wavelength but the lambda 2 in that case will always be greater than the lambda 1 okay that means the wavelength of the emitted light will always be greater than the wavelength of the excited light and this phenomenon is known as stock's law or stock shift okay it is applicable for both the fluorescence microscopy and fluorescence spectroscopy so this phenomenon is known as stokes law or shift in some textbooks you may find the term shift or in some textbook you may find the term law but both the things are the same okay now the longer wavelength emitted light will go towards upward in the microscope and during that time it will first face the objective lens okay and here the objective lens will play the role of a objective lens and allow the light to pass through okay now this higher wavelength light now will face the dichromatic mirror so now is dichromatic mirror will going to reflect it no because i have told you it will only reflect the shorter wavelength light so dichromatic mirror also allow to be allow the light to be transmitted okay now it will face the barrier filter okay so barrier filter is kind of our for our protection because there can be a chance that there can be a light of uv uv region okay that is the region between 200 to 400 nanometer okay so this uv light i think i not have to mention that this uv light is harmful for our eyes okay so for just doing an experiment we will have to be blind right so that is not favorable that is why we have incorporated a barrier filter here not only for us along with that if there will be let's say suppose a technical error in the dichromatic mirror or constructional error in the dichromatic mirror so as a result if the dichromatic mirror allows some residual excited light to pass through instead of allow them to be reflected then the barrier filter will remove those kind of excitation light again there if there can be a constructional error or technical error for which some of the short wavelength excited light become allowed by the dichromatic mirror to move upwards the microscope so under such circumstances barrier filter will also remove those kind of residual excited light okay so that means here we have only the longer wavelength light and which is also devoid of uv 
right now this is our ocular lens which will further magnify it and then the, it will be our eyes which will visualize it okay so that is the entire concept of epifluorescence microscopy why the name epifluorescence microscopy because here the light source is above the specimen okay so now epifluorescence microscopy can be used for detecting any kind of biological specimen it is widely useful for ecology where we, we can also detect various kind of microorganism various kind of photosynthetic microorganism so now you tell me that are we will going to stain those kind of photosynthetic microorganism no because photosynthetic means that microorganism possesses chlorophyll right and i have told you at the very beginning of that lecture that chlorophyll is a natural fluorescent dye okay so we have not we do not have to stain them okay and for other microorganism detection we have to stain them we will going to discuss about various kind of staining technique so that is how epifluorescence microscopy works and epi with the help of epifluorescence microscopy we can also detect or also distinguish between a live cell and a dead cell by comparing the intensity of the color that we are having okay and also various kind of protein present on the surface of the cell can also be detected with the help of epifluorescence microscopy okay now so i have mentioned that various kind of protein or surface protein can be visualized with the help of our epifluorescence microscopy right so let's discuss how it is possible so here we have to develop a primary antibody okay i hope you know about what is antibody right it is a immune component that protecting us from antigen right so now the question is how the primary antibody can be generated so the idea is very simple this protein is antigenic in nature that is why primary antibody is constructed so we will inject that protein into a mice okay remember this that we have to inject that protein into a particular specimen for whom this protein will be considered as a foreign agent okay because only then our immune uh, the, the immune system of that particular specimen uh, particular organism will activate will be activated and leads to the formation of antibodies that will be specific towards the this kind of protein okay now we will isolate them and we will use them for our process so this this antibody is y shaped structure and here these two arms are the antigen binding region okay so now we will add them and if suppose our cell contains the protein we are suspecting so our antibody will bind over here okay now we can perform two techniques we can also inject that primary antibody into a specimen for whom that primary antibody will be considered as a foreign as a result what will happen the primary uh, on the basis of that primary antibody our the immune system of that particular organism will construct secondary antibody okay and now we will label those secondary antibody with fluorescent molecule although here they have the picture described this as an enzyme we can also use fluorescence just see this one okay so we can also do this directly by attaching the fluorescent molecule in the primary antibody or we can also use that indirect method here we, we have to label the secondary antibody with fluorescent tag okay then whenever we will apply a light of a particular wavelength we have to know that at what wavelength that fluorescent tag will fluoresce okay then the fluorescence will be detected and then we can easily detect them with the help of epifluorescence microscopy okay so that is how both direct and indirect 
way we can detect specimen with the help of this kind of microscopy okay now let's discuss about another kind of microscopy that is transmitted fluorescence microscopy okay so here i do not have to discuss too much i would i only just want to say that here the light source is below the specimen that's it okay that is that means it is quite like our conventional microscopes that we are using okay so that is why the name transmitted fluorescence microscopy so if you face any kind of question regarding that that what is the difference between epifluorescence and transmitted fluorescence microscopy then you have just to mention that in case of epifluorescence microscopy the light is above the specimen and in case of transmitted fluorescence microscopy as you can see the light is below the specimen okay and another thing you can also mention that in epifluorescence microscopy we are using only objective lens okay which will act as a objective lens as well as condenser but in case of transmitted fluorescence microscopy we have separated condenser separated objective lens another thing epifluorescence microscopy have a barrier filter sorry not barrier filter epifluorescence microscopy have a dichroic mirror we have discussed about the dichroic mirror but transmitted fluorescence microscopy lacks it okay so now the last topic where we will going to discuss about how the staining is performed okay so there are three possible way suppose we we want to detect cellular component okay so we will direct use stains and use it normally or we can construct antibody and then we can level the fluorescent molecule at its fc portion okay so fc portion is that single stand portion is called fc portion of the antibody and this anti antigen binding region are known as fab portion of the antibody okay so that two process can be done whenever we are willing to detect the cellular component okay but whenever we will going to detect the dna we have to construct the complementary dna and then at its 5 prime end we will tag the fluorescent dye okay we can also tag this them at 3 prime end too depending on our choice what we want to do okay so this two type of staining procedure can be done if you want to detect cellular component you will use antibody tagged with fluorescent dye if you want to detect dna you have to construct a complementary single stranded dna which is tagged with fluorescent dye okay clear so for staining dna we will use acridine orange diamidino 2 phenyl indole we can you can simply remember about dapi that can be easy for you along with fluorescein th isothiocyanate okay so here whenever we will use a dna probe or antibodies to detect specific cellular component we can use this fitc and whenever our goal is to detect the cellular component with the help of antibody only we will use tritc that is tetramethyl rhodamine isothiocyanate okay so that is the four type of strain that we can use so acridine orange for dna detection diamidino 2 phenyl indole for dna detection fluorescein isothiocyanate for cellular component detection either via dna probe or via antibody okay and tetramethyl rhodamine isothiocyanate whenever we will willing to detect cellular components with the help of antibodies okay so now i am just providing you the notes that i have prepared so that you can use this for your examination purpose okay so here i have mentioned the thing that a rapid return result in fluorescence that is applicable for your friend which is not a die, die, uh, die hard marvel fan and a delayed return is applicable for you which facilitates phosphorescence okay so that is the video lecture for fluorescence microscopy so i hope this video will be helpful to you and if it is please hit the like button share with your friends and subscribe to my channel to get more videos like that
and thank you for listening to this class